Hello and welcome to Ditching Hourly. I'm Jonathan Stark. Today I am joined by guest Paul Klein. Paul, welcome to the show. Hello, Jonathan. Nice to be here. Great to have you. So for folks who maybe haven't encountered you before, could you start by just telling uh, people a little bit about who you are and what you do? <laughs> Absolutely. Honored to be here. And uh, yeah, I'm a uh... I'm an entrepreneur, solopreneur, freelancer, whatever it is. I've been practicing social distancing since 09. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm a recovering 1980s hairband guitarist. So nice. uh, a lot in there. But We've got uh, that in common. <laughs> absolutely. And um, it, uh, yeah, I was doing it on the West Coast. I think you were on the East Coast. But yeah, uh, but, uh, yeah no, I, I, um, I went out on my own. So uh, like many of us uh, at 40, I was, you know, I had the three kids, the mortgage, it was the peak of the recession. And, um, and I was, uh, you know, I just dreaded, I was like, man, I got to stay here another 15 years before I retire. <laughs> I hated the job and I started looking inward and so forth. And I had been doing a little bit of moonlighting and consulting on the side for many years. And I've been in that same, um, field for, for over 18 years. And so I, I finally said, you know, I, uh, I want to kind of do something on my own. So started moonlighting on the side a little bit. And then just gradually over time and in 09, I finally made that jump into full-time consulting and haven't looked back. And uh, so I uh, did that in 09. And then uh, 16, we started, uh, we took some of that IP we developed, my business partner and I, and developed a SaaS company out of it. And then more recently, since about 18, I, I do some business coaching and consulting and learned a lot from you about pricing because that's one of my favorite subjects as well. Cool. And, uh, and I've been doing that, uh, still doing that to, the, to this day. There's something entrepreneurial about us 80s uh, <laughs> metal guys. I don't know what it yeah. is. <laughs> I guess it's like, it's like trying so hard to get people to come out to the show that they probably don't want to go to. It <laughs> makes, turns us into like natural marketers or something. I don't know. Uh, great. That is quite a journey. Um, I, I already have like a million questions I'd love to tease out. So I almost don't even need to ask this. I was going to start with like, what, what caused you to be most dissatisfied at the full-time job and like really pushed you out the door? Like what caused you to jump in 09? Yeah. Well, it was really just, I was living by everybody. I think that's, this kind of ties back to our, our rebellious days early on in the, tw in my twenties, uh, you know, I, I was supposed to go to college, you know, and, and, you know, all that kind of stuff. You know, I, yeah. my dad's a PhD from UC Davis, all my, all my, even my step parents are teachers. So I was expected to go to college. And so that whole conformity thing didn't work well with me in my twenties. And then finally uh, Nirvana came along and kind of crushed the whole rock and roll a night party uh, every day kind of thing. And yeah. so I was like, I'm not really into this. So I cut my hair, got a job, did the responsible thing, got married. Uh, my wife, straighten me out for uh, all, all intents and purposes, but you know, I was doing, doing really well, but it was at that age of 40, I was like, man, I just don't, I, you know, I'm living someone else's dream. I just don't, you know, I don't enjoy it anymore. And I just couldn't, and, uh, and I, and I really could have went one of two paths and that was the path of stay there, die of a heart attack, commit suicide. Who knows what would have happened? Right. <laughs> it was, it was a dark, dark area to be in like yeah. many people. Yeah. And I, I just found the, the whole entrepreneurship and business um, side of things just so freeing and everything. And I was really a, a, an entrepreneur stuck in a bureaucracy mm. and uh, just right said, you know, put it. yeah, and just, you have to, I have to go out and, um, you know, write my own ticket. And I was really, that's what I was designed to do. And so, uh, uh, and, and as you know, John, when we were growing up, it was like, go to college or join the military, you know, totally. it was like, yeah, that was, those are my two choices. Yep. Yeah. And so, so there was no, there's starting a business. So that's irresponsible. You have kids and a mortgage. You can't do that. You yep. know, you're not supposed to do that. And uh, once I realized I could do that and I niched down and really dove in and looked at my, uh, my own skills and, and uh, things that I could offer to the market, uh, man, it just exploded from there. Yeah. It's such a great fertile creative area to be in. It's, I mean, it's scary because you, you know, you, you're the only one up there making, you know, I'm like picturing a solo music. Like I, I went into a solo music career after my band broke up. I just, that wasn't my band, it was our band, but, mm -hmm. uh, and it was like, it's just you. I was like, wow, like, Hey, nobody's here to cover up my missed <laughs> notes. Uh, I yes. mean, I gotta hit all the notes. <laughs> nope. It's just, it's just me up here behind the mic. And it's this, it was the same thing with, uh, you know, with making that leap. So it's very, it can be very scary to people. So, uh, let's go a tiny bit more detail there. How long did you moonlight before you made the leap? Like how, how, I mean, were you like, like strapping on a parachute on the way down or, you know, building the plane on the way down or, or was it a little bit more predictable than that? 
Yeah, I, I, I kind of, um, you know, I had three kids and a mortgage. And if you remember in o- October of 08, the stock market crashed, went down yeah, to like 5,000. Yeah. And, and uh, it was a bit bleak times. Obama was just uh, the new president. And it was a lot of hope there. But at the same time, the economy and the time to start a business wasn't then. But if you go back to 05, I think that's when I started really started really on my personal development, reading books, Thou Shall Prosper by Rabbi Lappin, hmm. uh, Michael Gerber, you know, the yeah. myth you know, and they're talking about go to work on your business, not in your business. That was a huge one. Yeah. Yeah. And so just the, all those types of different things just feed my mind with really good content. And, and then I said, you know, what, what skill can I take? And like I said, I was really in the architectural space. And so, you know, building plumbing, electrical, structural and everything, but I took one of those specific areas and just niched down and told people, Hey, I, I do consulting in this, you know, if I can help you out, let me know. And my network, I didn't do Instagram. Well, there was no Instagram back then, but I think Facebook was around, but it wasn't about social media. It was all about relationships and uh, just put a stake in the ground, said, I'm a consultant um, in this niche. And, and then uh, that started to ramp up. And what happened was I started just, you know, on the card table and, you know, doing it about 15 hours a week, just, you know, building it slowly, refining the contracts, refining the marketing, refining the, whether to get paid first or just do the work and hope you get bill paid on a net 30 <laughs> billing hourly, mm-hmm. which uh, was atrocious and so forth that cut my teeth. And then finally I was, it was, I think it was the fall of 08. My, my wife was like, you know, I know you're miserable, but don't, uh, don't tell me if you quit. Cause she, you know, we're three kids <laughs> in a mortgage and I go, okay, I won't, but she knew I was moonlighting and I was doing really well. I was probably, I mean, I wasn't making a ton of money. I was probably making, I don't know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars on the side, but I knew if I could do it full time, I could cover my salary. And uh, one day she calls and says, Hey, um, it was on the weekend. She said, Hey, Paul, can you pick up the kids on Monday? Cause uh, I have a doctor's appointment and I won't be able to get them. I said, well, I can pick up the kids whenever you want now. <laughs> like, no, you didn't do it. And I go, yes, I did. And she's on. Ah. And then, uh, once, uh, as I was like, I'm working whatever hours I have to, to, uh, to make it happen. And yeah, you know, went from 20, 30 grand to 60 to 80 to, you know, 200, 300 and never broke a million in my consulting business, but got up into the uh, regularly get up into the high um, uh, six figures. Yeah. 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 So that's great. Great story. Um, Okay. So just to, just to clarify, you were doing 20 or 30 on the side while you're still employed. And then you were like, okay, this is predictable. Were you, how, how, I'm just curious, like your pipeline, like, were you getting a decent amount of leads and you just felt like, ah, you know, I could do this, like, or was it more like you, you, uh, yeah, I guess, I guess the real question is how many clients did you have when you made the leap? Yeah. Let me think. I'm, I, it's been so long. I can't remember exactly how many, but I, what I did is, and this is one of the things I talk about and teach, which is kind of on parallel with what you do, Jonathan. Mm-hmm. And that is, I, I really believe in having what's called three pillars of revenue. And what I did early on is I, first thing I did is I, I just put a stake in the ground. I talked to people at, at meetings or what you call watering holes, but yeah. these were back in those days, they were like association meetings, local, yeah. you know, association meetings. And I just handed out cards and I got um, pretty steady local work with local mom and pop shops and so forth. Uh, but the other thing I did is I, I created an ebook and, uh, the, and, and in California at the time there was a local, um, certification process coming along, what's called CAST, and it stands for Certified Access Specialist. And it's basically related to Americans with Disabilities Act and architecture and, and engineering and so forth. And I created a little ebook that basically took all the content you needed to study for that, that uh, uh, exam and put it on a PDF. And this was bef- this was like PayPal. There was no like Wix or anything. So I, I just, I just hacked together some kind of like paywall where you could get access to this PDF. And it was, it was curated content. It wasn't even original content. Right. And I sold that for $29. And I, I think in the first, that was, was it maybe it was a second year first or first year. I think it was probably close to a, tw- a bulk of that 30 grand in that first year was like 20 of that was just from that ebook. Wow. And, yeah. And it was That's crazy. A home run. Yeah. So having that on the side to, to, to grow. And then what that did is uh, that created an email before I knew about email marketing and relationships and warm, it, it created a, a warm audience. So once we went full time in 09, that September, we did our first workshop. Mm-hmm. And so that's what I talk about the three pillars, you know, online courses and education, um, live training and workshop type seminars, and then an e um, 
you know, presence, uh, an online presence. And so we did this workshop, we had a warm audience and then we, we sold that out. Um, you know, I think we were charging at the time six or $700 and we, we had like 30 people show up to the first one. Now we regularly charge about two grand and, uh, we get, you know, 50 people a time, you know, um, regularly now, 10 years later. Nice. Great. What did you mean about that last one? Online presence? I mean, like, um, when I say like e-product, like, um, online courses, um, productized services, I guess would be one like, uh, you know, but more, more in my case, it was more, uh, e-products. Like, uh, it was like that, that PDF that we charge for checklists, um, eBooks, things that you can, things that you, uh, build once and that you can charge, you know, over and over like an online course and so yeah. forth. So, yeah. cool. so that's yeah. kind of the three, you know, the consulting, the in-person speaking and training, and then that online, you know, foot digital footprint with products and services for sale there. Got it. Yeah. Perfect. Can't argue with that. It's a classic formula. <laughs> yeah, it worked worked back then, and uh, everybody says, "Well, you know, it's different than back then." And I go, "I, I think it's actually probably easier now." <laughs> yeah. You know, you know, uh, it, it is more flooded, but uh, exactly. But, but an email list, as you know, John. I mean, you know, I, I I archive all your emails. I just love them. They come in every day, and um, and you know, most people only do once a week. And I always thought, well, every day is too much, but it, there's always you you do a really good job of providing tons of value. And nice. that's why we stay subscribed. Right. Yeah. If, if you're always glad you read them, it doesn't, I could send 10 a day. If you're glad you, it would be hard for, to do to make you glad every time you read. Yeah. And day, you don't, but. yeah. And you don't have, and I don't, I, I've never seen a Facebook ad from you, Instagram, LinkedIn, or anything like that. So yeah. email is where it's at. That's, that's been my experience over this last, you know, 12 years. Yeah. I mean, I, I experimented with Facebook ads, I think in 2015 maybe 2016 just just to see if i could drive people to a webinar or a free page on my site yeah. and i was like this is not how i want to spend my life in facebook ad manager so yeah <laughs> you know I, I don't think i've spent 50 bucks on ads in my entire career yeah so uh yes okay great so when you so, so i'm fast forwarding from 09 you're growing the the ebooks initially was really good. They sold checklists and other digital zero marginal cost kinds of products. Mm -hmm. Live workshops, you increasingly you steadily increase the price over time. That's great. You got good. And this is all still basically local businesses, I'm guessing, or primarily local. Well, I started to branch out. Yeah, that first workshop. One of the first people that came to our workshop was uh, someone from Yum Brands. And if you're not familiar with Yum Brands, it's Kentucky Fried Chicken. Pepsi owns it. It's yeah, a very large. Yeah. That, so this that, this is how I got my very first Fortune 500 client. And, and I, I believe you talk about this too a lot in your training, John, about doing, you know, workshops and seminars. And that very first one, I happened to have someone from Yum. It was a, a planted the seed. It wasn't for a year or a year and a half later that I ended up getting a contract with them. Mm -hmm. Once I had that contract, that blew the doors open. Now all of a sudden target JC Penney's, you know, Cracker Barrel, you know, and, and all these other um, large companies. Cause it just, it just kind of happened. So I, it was mostly smaller mom and pops. I say, Oh, nine, Oh, 10. And I think in 11, I got my, you know, it was about three years in, and I think that's mm -hmm. kind of the magic number it seems like. And, that, and that's when it just, it just took off. Okay. So let's drill into that a little bit. So that that's the path that my consulting business took as well, where, where I, I remember when I first quit my job, my dad was the one that was like, well, oh, you know, you're going to start hiring employees. And I was like, no, nah, I'm not going to, I don't want to be a boss. And he's like, well, how are you going to grow the business? And I was like, by getting bigger customers. <laughs> and, uh, and that's exactly what I did. So, but how did you, I, I, there's like a disconnect in my mind here. If you're niche down on architecture originally, what was Yum Brands doing there? Yeah. So this, uh, I'll go a little bit more into detail, just so you understand kind of the, the consulting business I do. So, in that in that vertical, um, my expertise was related to um, closely related to like building inspection. I had worked for local uh, jurisdictions like counties and cities doing regulatory compliance inspections and those kinds of things gotcha. related to plumbing, electrical, mechanical. Well, what I did, uh, I said, hey, how can I niche down and, and go into an area that, that's really underserved? And, and this area of Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, mm -hmm. which basically says all public accommodations like Starbucks and movie theaters have to be accessible to persons with disabilities. Well, in California, as you may or may not have heard, but I'm sure some of your audience has, that's always been a... Um, 
an area of the drive-by lawsuits. Uh, Anderson Cooper's talked about on 60 Minutes. And so I said, wow, this is a really rough pain point for businesses and large businesses. So why don't I specialize in the Americans with Disabilities Act and show these businesses how to comply? I've got almost 20 years experience in that. And so that's what I niched down in. And so uh, what happened through the training when I was training those types of courses and so forth on the Americans with Disabilities Act, we attracted people, uh, construction managers, architects, engineers from those large um, companies come to our training. And they said, hey, by the way, do you do you do survey work or, and um, uh, audits? And so a lot of these brands through their construction process will update their uh, brand. Starbucks will go through, you know, every five to seven years and do a brand refresh, you know, just kind of. And so they'll do what's called a, a pre pre-construction report where we go through, identify all the issues. And then, and then when they do uh, construction drawings and CDs um, on the, uh, on the uh, brand refresh, they'll incorporate all those compliance issues, including ADA. So one little piece of that big um, process is, is what I specialized in and only did, didn't do anything else. And that set me apart and how I was able to build that business. Killer. Yeah, that's great. Wow. Okay. So that really connected the dots. So <laughs> I, I hope the dear listener is like, it, it, I hope this is landing. Like it's, it's not uh, like when you first gave the overview of like your growth numbers, for example, the, the way your numbers grew, it, it's, it's like, wow, like that's, that's pretty dramatic. But when you get under the covers a little bit, it's kind of a natural progression. Yeah. And, and like you said, it blew the doors open once the young brands people came and you started doing work at that level and you got these bigger and bigger clients. And the reason you can uh, charge more, and we'll talk about this in a second. The reason you can charge more to bigger clients is because the assistance that you're giving them, the help that you're giving them is magnified 10 or a hundred or a thousand fold downstream because of the size of the company. Correct. So they're hard to get into, but once you get into them and you're operating at that level, it's not surprising when more of them come knocking and you know, it's a struggle to break through to that first one. Like you said, it's, you know, maybe there's a little bit of luck, but you also have to be prepared to prepared and willing to seize that opportunity when it does eventually arrive. And if you're, here's the key, if you're billing by the hour, it doesn't actually help you because you're probably, you probably think it's only fair to charge the same hourly <laughs> rate to all of your clients, even the mom and pops, you know, mom and pops on the one end and, PepsiCo on the other end, but PepsiCo is getting dramatically more value out of, even if you do the exact same activities for PepsiCo as you did for mom and pop, whatever pizza place, then they're getting massively more value from it than mom and pop ever will. So you can't charge mom and pop a million dollars, but maybe you can charge PepsiCo a million dollars because they're trying to mitigate a hundred million dollar risk, or they've got a, a billion dollar project or whatever, and they don't want any little piece of it to go awry. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, that's what we do. And, and we kind of, it kind of ties into what you teach John real well and in the value uh, conversation and value-based pricing and so forth. And so you, the, the service, the essential service that we do for a mom and pop flower shop at our local um, city mm -hmm. is essentially functionally the same as what we would do for, let's say Kaiser or, uh, you know, target or whatever. Mm -hmm. The difference is in, in like a, not uh, is either Kaiser or one of the other medical outfits. Uh, they had a $250 million um, class action lawsuit. Oh. So when we position our services up against that, because our niche specifically prevents those types of $250 million class action lawsuits. So it's an easy value conversation. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. even though our fee may be several hundred thousand, you know, for their fleet of buildings uh, nationwide, it's a yeah, fraction. Right. It's a risk management calculation. that's easy to, to get them, show them the ROI on. Right. And so, okay. So let's, this is great. This is a real natural segue into, um, okay, you're operating at this level. It makes perfect sense to pay someone that much money to mitigate a potential $200 million lawsuit or class action lawsuit. But why, why you, <laughs> you can't be the only expert at, uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act, or or are you? No, no. There's there's several larger firms. Uh, uh, we work. Uh, there's firms in Chicago and uh, Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, some friends that are friends of ours that we know in the in the um, industry and so forth. But mm -hmm. it came down to relationships uh, with Yum Brands. They were uh, tired of their client or their um, the consultant that they had, mm -hmm. and so <laughs> they were like. 
they were looking for somebody. It just was, I think maybe that was the luck of the draw. They were looking for somebody. They liked us. We had a, um, we had lunch with them, uh, flew down to Irvine mm-hmm. at their headquarters, uh, the Taco Bell headquarters. And, um, that was the first brand we, we worked with the, um, mm-hmm. and, uh, it was all about the relationship. So I, I don't, I, and I'd be my encourage, encouragement to your listeners. Don't focus on the the grand volume of, of everything and all the other competitors focus on that one or two relationships that may be at that ideal company and mm-hmm. nurture that and, mm-hmm. and lean into that rather than trying to go after, rather than trying to go after five or 10 young brands. I had one connection, you know, that, that, uh, and I remember taking, uh, Steve, my contact there, he's retired now, but uh, took him to PF Chang's said, what do you think about us doing all your stores nationwide? And he's like, I'd love that. <laughs> he thought, well, we want to get rid of our firm. I'm like, ah, oh, perfect. <laughs> so, so it just, uh, yeah, just, you know, you, you got to lean into those relationships and go shake hands and the watering holes that you talk about, John, and, yeah. um, and not just worry about the shiny object flashing Facebook ads and mm. Instagram, all that. I don't know. Doesn't, doesn't maybe work for some people. I'm not knocking it. It's just for me that that's not how I got there. Yeah. Yep. I agree. And it, it definitely does work for some people, but it's not my style either. And, and I, and I do think that it's more appropriate for different kinds of audiences, like certain people who are, uh, you, I think probably you're an example, certainly in my, once my book came out in 2010, I was working with, you know, household name brands all the time. And it was like, those people are not scrolling through TikTok, you know, or, or whatever TikTok was at the time, you know, Vine or something like they're not doing that. And, and if they are, they're not looking for a consultant. Right. <laughs> exactly. Know, they're in a totally different frame of mind. They're either looking at cat pictures or whatever, and they're going to zoom right by some silly ad or whatever. But if you're out there, you know, uh, especially back then for me, it was especially books and speaking like, if you know, pre pandemic, of course, it was a little bit less complicated. But you know, if you wrote mm-hmm. a book every year or two, and then you sort of toured behind the book doing hitting all the, the big conferences, yeah, yeah, I would just have a line of people coming up to me afterwards being like, Hey, we got to talk like when yeah. can we talk? So yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of, kind of what we did too, is we, we'd, uh, early on, I, I would go to any chamber of commerce and do like a free up to a free two hour. Here's how you can prevent lawsuits for your business. Mm-hmm. And I do those all day long, all over Northern California in the Bay area, you know, we, yeah. you know, wine country, make a weekend out of it. And, uh, yeah. I just hit that all the time and, and slowly over time, just, you know, made those connections with uh, bigger and bigger um, businesses. And then the other thing is, you got to know your niche and know your contacts within that enormous organization. So in my case, it was definitely uh, VP of construction, VP of development, new store development, those kinds of things, not the um, C-suite, you know, or mark, you know, marketing person, you know, Mm -hmm. HR, none of the, you know, I had, I had, it was a very, very specific uh, vertical within the, the the department or the uh, companies that you want to reach out and, and develop those relationships. Yep. Yeah. I talk about, I I don't talk about this as much as I could, or I don't distinguish as much, but that's super important. So I just want to like tease that out a little. So the, you've got three different, you've, you've so far described three different dimensions that you, where you turned the dial up to highly focused. So the one dimension was your specialization, the ADA, Mm -hmm. and then you, you, uh, zoomed in on, um, a, well, you tell me, it's, I, I feel like it was restaurants specifically, but maybe that's just the examples that are coming up. But- yeah, that's, that's definitely been one of the, one of the primaries restaurants. So QSRs, quick serve mm-hmm. restaurants are a big bulk of my clientele today, but um, you know, Slack is one of my uh, clients, um, you know, Starbucks has been in the past, uh, mm-hmm. a lot of attorneys. So it, 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 it varies. And, and what happens is because we're known in this vertical, um, we'll have clients come back to us. You know, I have clients that will call me from 10, Hey, 10 years ago, you worked on a project. <laughs> you still doing it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What do you need? And, and so forth. So, Great. so restaurants are definitely uh, one of the bigger, bigger, um, clients and because of a lot of the restaurants I've worked with, uh, you know, yeah. yeah. So then it just kind of breeds more referrals in that way. So, okay. So just to finish the thought, so hyper-focused specialization, really, really tightly focused, uh, vertical. And you could even say, uh, of a size too, you know, so like really big restaurants, so restaurant industry, 
um, you even went down to QSRs, which is even a niche inside of that. Yeah. <laughs> and then, and then a particular ideal buyer inside of that really focused target market. Yes. So, you know, VP of construction, did you say? Yeah. VP of destruct construction, director of development. Yeah. 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 So yeah. boom. So, so you could, so someone who was that focused could literally go to LinkedIn and get a list of 300 exact people that need to be on their mailing list. Yes. or need to go to the next webinar or that you could invite to your next webinar or that you could invite to a thing. Hey, I'm going to be in town doing a presentation on how to not get sued. Want to yep. come? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And if you, if you, uh, you know, John, uh, John, you've been on my podcast, you know, in my business consult co coaching side, you kind of know me more from that. Cause that's when I really mm -hmm. started putting on, on, um, social, but if you go look at my LinkedIn and I think mm -hmm. Blair N says this, you want to really know what somebody does go look at their LinkedIn. <laughs> and so, uh, my LinkedIn is totally targeted to that vertical still. Um, mm -hmm. and so, and right now, um, it's QSRs and, and the self storage. Uh, so I spoke at the self storage um, association in Vegas, uh, last, uh, last summer, uh, the restaurant association in, uh, Charlotte, um, mm -hmm. in uh, March of last year, I think it was. And, uh, so yeah, so you, that's, that's to, to your point, that's how you, you know, you got to go and find those ideal clients of yours and, yep. and their, their watering holes. Yep. Okay. So uh, we could do go all day on this, but let's move forward in the timeline because uh, you've also really perked up my interest, uh, by saying earlier that you sort of wrapped your IP up into a SAS, which is, <laughs> is pretty surprising when you, when I, you know, now that I know all the specifics about what you were doing in your consulting. So let's, how did that transition take place? Yeah. So I'm, uh, so this is your, your software developers and, uh, software people will, will appreciate this. So first off, I'm not a tech guy. I don't know code or anything like that. So my business partner and I, who, um, had that ADA consulting business that I've been, been, we've been talking about, mm -hmm. um, in, we had like you, John, I, I, I became a file maker. Um, mm. uh, you know, I, I got really good at file maker and I, I built my own database because we were doing all this work all over nationwide, right. you know, to be more productive, make more money, you need to automate. So I was, I was playing with their, um, uh, what was their old mobile app that they used to have. Oh, and the yeah. other thing, FileMaker Go. FileMaker, yeah, FileMaker Go. And, uh, the other thing, uh, it would do is it would allow you to do a pick list with more than I think, uh, 600 characters access didn't do that. So I developed this, uh, FileMaker, um, database real early that we used. I had it hosted on a, I don't know, an old Mac mini or something somewhere I paid for. And, <laughs> and basically I was able to ping it from anywhere in the nation and, and any sub consultants that I had. And then about, I think it was early 15. I, and I'd always said, man, it, you know, this is really good stuff. I mean, we have so much really value here that so many other companies could use it. I want to find a way to productize it, if you will, you know, or, and scale yeah. this into a real product. So we invested in a real file maker developer beyond my skills to, to develop the first prototype and then um, ran into a software company called Technicate out of Rancho Cordova near Sacramento and uh, Chris James, our C uh, who's our CEO now, and uh, um, Damon Brown and Josh Hovina, uh, they're 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 uh, one fifth owner in this company called Blue Dag. So it's my business. So there's five of us that own it. And so we basically said, hey, we'll bring all the IP, our FileMaker um, uh, database. They had all the web app programmers, iOS programmers. They were a full you know full house uh, development company. And so we created a new company called Blue Dag LLC. Uh, we mm -hmm. put in the IP. They put in the development. And that was, uh, we released that in April of 16, I think it was, or March of 16. Mm -hmm. And we've gone on, we've got, uh, you know, Royal Caribbean, City of Oakland. And, and this particular software is uh, designed for local governments and architectural firms. So we have a lot of large architectural firms nationwide that use it as well as uh, local jurisdictions because local cities and counties also have to comply with the, the ADA. So mm -hmm. we took all that IP and that regulatory know-how that we had developed put it into a full web, web-based, uh, you can go to bluedag.com and see it. Hmm. And, um, and I think we have, we have, over, I, I can't remember the number of clients, but I know we're, we're doing over a million dollar a year in revenue. We're trying to get to the 2 million. Um, so hopefully someone will become interested and buy us all out. That's well, our maybe, yeah, maybe someone's <laughs> listening to this that will come knocking. Great. That's great. And so what are we five years later, million in sales, you get a lot of cooks in the kitchen. There's so a million doesn't go as far as it used to, wow. but, um, but that's, that's non-trivial. I mean, that's great. And presumably 
I mean, if you're still running the old business, presumably there's some overlap between, yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the nice thing is I have a real app now that my, that my team can use. And then, um, you know, we cross, we cross, uh, utilize staff for different projects. We team up on stuff. And so it's a, it's a real, real, real good, uh, compliment, but, uh, um, and then also that company doesn't specialize in actual survey work. So when they get calls, Hey, do you know anybody who can do survey work? They, they throw it our way. Right. <laughs> so it, right. it's, it just works out real well. Killer. Wow. That's great. Okay. So, so you've got a goal for that. You'd like to double the revenue there. So, okay. Um, but apparently that's not taking up too much of your time because you know, what's happened since then or, or bringing us closer to like, well, let's go up to, to 18, 2018. And that's when you said you started doing business coaching more seriously. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really, um, you know, that was launched and, and blue dag is uh, kind of a, its own runs itself. I don't deal with the day to day. I'm just one fifth owner in that. So we have a full team support. It's a self-running company that I just show up for quarterly meetings and either give money or, or they, or get money. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, I, so that's able to run on its own. I'm not heavily involved on the day to day. So yeah, in 18, I was like, man, I really, you know, everything's going good. And I, and I really was enjoying um, the whole podcasting world and just, you know, the whole personal brand. And, and I uh, really was enjoying, I had, had helped a lot of people just kind of on the side, kind of just people say, Hey, how do you do what you do? And so I was doing a little bit of moonlighting like that. And so I formalized and created paulkline.net. And one of the areas I realized I really like and learned all over all these years is, is like you, John is, is the pricing. And so I, you know, I started consuming all the, you know, you and Blair ends and um, Baker. And I had all, all of you, all you guys on my podcast and, uh, and kind of took a little bit from everybody as well as the things that I've learned. And, and, and more than anything, I, I learned why things were working and didn't work. You know, you talk about, um, you know, price anchoring and things like that. And some of the spreads that I really, really found valuable. And, and, and I had done some of that in, in uh, my own uh, practice over the years. And it's like, Oh, that's why that works. Right. You know, <laughs> yeah. you know yeah. I read that in ditching hourly. That makes sense. Yeah. And, but I had moved away from hourly billing years ago. I learned that right. lesson early on. It was, I've, I've, it's always been project based. Yeah. Yep. Great. Okay. So, um, so where did you go? Well, oh, wait, before we go there, <laughs> you are still, are you still currently actively doing anything with the ADA stuff? I mean, you said your LinkedIn is still oriented around that. Yeah. Or you... yeah I still have that consulting business. My goal, um, long-term would, would be to shift into more business coaching, um, Love to write a book someday called "The Magic of Pricing Big." <laughs> oh, I uh, like that title. Yeah, uh, and uh, you know, with with the anchoring concepts and mm -hmm. things that you that you teach too. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but but and so that would be my goal. And uh, but I, I I've never been able to uh, turn that coaching business into enough to to replace my consulting. So. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe it's one foot in both doors. Maybe if I just jumped from one to the other, it would, I could do it. But, uh, you know, we had moved, uh, um, from California to Nashville, um, in, um, June of, uh, 2020. So, um, kids are grown. Uh, we're, I'm a little heady on the kids. So they're all, we're empty nest. And, uh, yeah. and, uh, just, I just enjoy the entrepreneurship, uh, much more. I think, I think it's, um, Guy Hendricks talks about your zone of excellence versus your zone of genius. And, um, I think the ADA is certainly my zone of excellence. I'm good at it, but, um, I really enjoy this whole world of entrepreneurship and, and, um, you know, helping people get out from that dreadful day job and go out on their own and, and hit it big and, and, uh, you know, or, or hit it big in, in what works for them in, in terms of time and money freedom. Yeah. It's super gratifying when, when people can, you know, give them some information and a little, coaching and just like, man, when they, when they take it and run with it, it's so, yeah. it's so great. I mean, like, it's just transformational. It's like, wow, that was, it's life altering. Yeah. Yeah. And you help so many people with that. I mean, I've been in your, uh, your pricing course and just amazed at all the, all the, uh, the movement you, you got, you know, you, and you do such a great job with that. And, and, uh, it's, it's just, uh, I, I've never gotten to that level like you have and, and, uh, you uh, you know, you've been doing a lot longer than I have for sure. And, uh, you know, maybe I've taken a little break of that cause I'm launching a new, uh, a new product, but, uh, um, I'm still, uh, that's still in my blood for sure. And it's related. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. So what is the new thing? Cause it does feel like, cause I'm already aware of it, but just let the listeners know. And it's, it, it seems like a natural continuation to me. I mean, but, but go ahead and explain it. It is. Yeah. So I, I've pivoted a little bit, the podcast and kind of my, like my, my, um, 
oh, business coaching piece uh, at Paul Kleinnet to a new product that we're launching, which is called Visible TV. So Visible TV is basically a the Netflix for entrepreneurs. And when I say entrepreneurs, I mean entrepreneurs like Jonathan Stark, people who, you know, nothing against Grant Cardone or Oprah or, um, you know, um, what's in Mark Cuban, you know, those guys are all great, you know, but there's a big gap between the billionaires that are typically profiled on Shark Tank and, and uh, the profit and so forth. And uh, people like us that are mm-hmm. building six and seven figure businesses with a team of 1099s, not necessarily employees, or maybe just a, a, a team of maybe t- uh, 10 or 10 or less. Mm. And so visible TV is profiling those folks in a very, um, high quality Netflix, uh, docu-series. And, uh, from these episodes that we do on each of the entrepreneurs, the list or the, the viewer can go, Hey, I, I identify with that. I, I can learn from that. Oh, I learned from, uh, you know, those mistakes and, and they really hear that story and it's, uh, um, very produced much like a, a Netflix documentary and it's streaming on Roku, uh, Amazon fire, iOS. Uh, we're launching formally on January 28th of 2020. I'm not sure when this episode's coming out, but, uh, you can go to visible tv.com and, um, and find out more information about it. Yeah. I mean, it looks great. Like when I first saw it, when I first saw it, I was like, Oh, it's like masterclass for entrepreneurs. You know, so, so, but I think your branding's better, like the, the tagline Netflix for entrepreneurs better because more people know what Netflix is, but, um, but yeah, the, the video quality is like insane, you know, it's, it's pro. So, yeah, I mm-hmm. appreciate that. That's, that's my business partner, Kendall. And this is where meeting the right person and creating something special magic can happen when you complement each other. And I've, I, for some reason, I've always worked like, like your guitar playing, uh, thing, you, you know, you were solo. I I've always worked better with someone that can complement my skills. So I'm the business and my business partner, Kendall is the art and he is uh, trained by Hans Zimmer. He was in Hans Zimmer studio in LA for a few years. Mm. He's done Netflix, um, uh, documentaries, full length documentaries. And, um, yeah, he's just uh, super good. And he writes all the music original, uh, we'll <laughs> figure out how we're going to scale that eventually. But, uh, right. right now it's very much a labor of love and, um, and we definitely want to get you on there, Jonathan, in 2022 when things, uh, uh, pan out for schedule yeah. and so forth. Uh, yeah, I I would love story, to. yeah, your story will be awesome for people to to see in a in a in a different format than uh, than uh, you know YouTube or a podcast. Even yeah, it's funny because like I, I find. Tell me what you think, but I found that there's kind of a uncanny valley or a no man's land between that kind of raw live stream YouTube video that it's warts and all, and it's so authentic and real, and you feel like you know the person. And then on this other end where it's almost like a premium experience where the, the video is just the lighting, the everything is just perfect. Yeah. And I find like anything in the middle is, ugh. Like <laughs> it just looks, it looks like a slick version of something. It's like someone, you know, lipstick on a paste, yeah. just like this cheap, yeah. So, yeah, like the cheap chrome on the on the accessories you could buy at the auto store, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's like putting a whale tail on a beat up Civic. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. like, come on, come on. <laughs> Still know? a Civic. Yeah, right. and that and that's what we're hoping to capture because you really do get that kind of Shawshank Redemption gladiator music and cinematic feel, but wrapped into your story about how you left corporate, how you worked with uh, I think it was Staples. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that was my my one cube job was at Staples. Yeah. Yeah. So, see, I know your story, and so uh, those and but pulling that out and and through your story, rather than just sit, getting John to come on and say, "Hey, give us the five tips to email marketing or right. not charging," you know, or ditching hourly, we we have you tell your story and and we edit together with B roll and so forth to kind of complement what you're talking about. And through that story, you know, we learn better through story than we do just in a here's the five tips on Facebook ads. Right. No, tell me, tell me what you did and how you were transformed. And, and, and then now I can apply that to my situation and learn from it. And also realize you're only a few steps ahead of me. You're not again nothing against Grant Cardone, yeah. <laughs> but uh, you know, uh, most people don't have a, a jet to fly around on. And so, <laughs> you know, it was a big, it was a big gap between there and where I'm at anyway. Yeah. Well, this might say a lot about me, but I have no idea who Grant Cardone is, but he sounds like he's rich. So, <laughs> Um, yeah, it's a great, I mean, I, that's so true. I mean, I have, I have, um, cl- uh, students like private coaching students who are, who are catching up. They're going to, they're going to exceed me. Right. I'm yeah. like, great. I'm going to be, you know, which I love because 
you know, the mission is real. Like the mission that I'm out there to do of, of ridding the world of hourly billing, it's not going to happen if, you know, I'm not going to live forever and it's not going to happen if it doesn't take on a life of its own. And, and you get these apostles out there who are then doing the same thing and multiply and multiply and multiply. Yeah. So I love that stuff and I have no interest. I, I couldn't be less interested in having a jet. I mean, that just sounds like hell <laughs> to me. Yeah. You know. Yeah. It's kind of like uh, having a whole team of 60 employees. I can't imagine. I mean, no. I, I love, I love, I don't know if, if I know you, I believe you have more like 1099 team, team people as Nothing. opposed to, no, I've got nobody. Same here. Yeah. And that, yeah. to me, that's the sweet spot. I mean, it, it rids you of all the regulatory issues. It gives you the freedom. You're not, you know, um, I had a friend of mine who had an engineering firm and he said, I'm, I never made so less money than until I hired a team because he, he cares about his team and their family and their livelihood. So he'll pay them over his own. Yeah. Just I've, to, seen, I've seen it a hundred times. Yeah. And, and, times. and oh, I haven't, the owner hasn't taken a paycheck in a year. Yeah. Cause you don't want to lose your people and you got their families depending on it. Whereas if you're in a, if you're a freelancer to freelancer, solopreneur, solopreneur, now you team up like Kendall and I, we teamed up on this. So I, you know, I, he's investing his time and expertise as I am, but we both have skin in the game, but we're not, mm. we're not counting hours. You know, we're, we're it's a 50, 50 partnership. So yeah. it's a win-win and we're not, yeah. you know, sitting there worrying about W2s and benefits yeah. and all that stuff. Right. It adds in a massive amount of friction and, and you know, nothing against it. Like if, if someone out there wants to be, you know, enjoys having a team and really wants to be a great boss and a great leader, then more power to you, you know, like it, it works, it does work. It's just not, not the way I uh, prefer to create leverage because even when I was just the VP, you know, after Staples, I went to work at a, a small firm. And by the time I was the VP, uh, you know, I wasn't even the owner and I was sweating people's mortgages. I was like, yeah. I was like worrying about one mortgage is enough. I don't want to worry about 10. <laughs> right. You know, that's, that's, that's literal up nights type of stuff to worry about. I, was like, I do not have the emotional maturity to handle that much. Pressure. I'm with you. I am so with you. Yeah. 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 It's uh, no employees. And uh, you know, I call myself a 1099 or a W nine K one since Oh nine. And uh, I'll, <laughs> I, I can't, uh, I can't ever go back and I don't want to uh, have employees. Yeah. Cool. This has been great. Um, can you tell folks where they can find out more about all the things that you're doing? Yeah, the best place, you know, the big thing uh, is now is get on uh, visibletv.com, check out some of the free videos we have. Uh, we got some great, great marketers and speakers and coaches uh, all up your alley, alley that I think people learn from. So go to mm -hmm. visibletv.com. Mm -hmm. I think we'll have a, uh, um, you know, some opportunities there because we're doing a launch. So there's some opportunities to get in there early and get a, like a substantial re reduced uh, rate in terms of uh, subscription if you're interested. And cool. then also go, go to paulkline.net. I, uh, I still have some pricing stuff on there and my, and my podcast is now rebranded to visible TV, but there's old episodes on there. Jonathan was on there. I think it was like episode 15 or 17. Um, Jonathan did a great job as well as some of the other people Jonathan's had on his podcast, like uh, Baker and, and Blair ends. Who's always awesome. Yes. Um, or we're on my Blair was my first interview and, I was trying to, I had the, the chickens in the background because in Northern California, I lived on five acres and, and these darn chickens just came up right when Blair and, and finally Blair couldn't, couldn't, uh, couldn't uh, resist it anymore. I said, Hey, tell the chickens. Hello. <laughs> I, felt like such a, uh, I felt like such a uh, amateur, but uh, he was, uh, he, he, he rolled with it and it was graceful. And, uh, and it was my very first podcast interview. So you've, want to get it if you want to get a kick out of my at my expense go check that out yeah do that yeah there's so much overlap uh it's it's been great keeping in touch over the years um yeah people should really check it out you know you, you, there's always like you, you know you might have heard blair here there and everywhere but it's always some or, or whoever you know david c baker yeah. and uh and so forth or ron baker i'm not sure which baker you're talking about I both bakers <laughs> david bakers. and ron yeah ron okay. uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, yes. I love, appreciate it, uh, Jonathan, and uh, always love your content, learn a lot from you and always uh, try to uh, uh, attribute you when I uh, learn, learn, because I've learned a lot from you. And so uh, it's always a, a pleasure to, to speak with you and, uh, and be on your show. Oh, thanks. Well, we better wrap up before my head gets too big to fit out the door. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right, folks, that's it for this week. I'm Jonathan Stark, and I hope you join me again next time for Ditching Hourly. Bye.